in his way on up and we're gonna kick things off here in the building and hello to people at home. So yeah, we are doing things a little different today and we're gonna, we're gonna start in a different way and keep going in a different way. Um, we, uh, yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you guys just a heads up and then as people come in, we'll probably repeat. But we are gonna do a different kind of worship today. Um, very, very different. <laughs> And you will find it if you look for it. Um, but yeah, our several of our worship leaders, almost all of our worship leaders, or every every worship leader, are away or healing, recovering <laughs> from surgery. And so we were like, you know what? We're not going to push it. Like we could find someone from another church or whatever. And we were kind of like, okay, God, what do you have for us today? in a different way, worship in a different way, because we know worship is beyond music and song, right? That there's other ways to worship. So. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so today at um, our our time of worship, we're going to just do several different things, um, and some of what we'll do. I'm, I actually um, grabbed my favorite, not my favorite, but one of my favorite psalms. What I think is, you know, darn near one of the most worshipful psalms in Scripture. And we're just gonna, I'm gonna read this, and we're gonna kind of pray it through together. Um, we're gonna give you guys a chance to actually um, just, you know, come up and just pray a prayer of gratitude or a prayer of thanks Mm -hmm. or um, just honor to God. And so it's going to look a little bit more prayerful for a bit. We're going to tell some God's stories in here. Um, Lexi and Jonathan Barth have some amazing news that they're going to be sharing with us this morning. Uh, Yeah, so it's going to be fun. So we wanted to let you guys know as we're going through this first part, if you have a God story like a two-minute God story. We love to have you come share. One of my favorite things is seeing uh, how amazing God is, how he is shining through, how he's on display in other people's lives and how he's moving. And that draws us to worship, doesn't it? It draws us to awe. So we'd love for you guys to kind of be thinking about that for this first part too. We'd love to hear from you guys. Like, what, what have you seen God do? And don't hold back. Like if you think, oh, maybe that's just kind of small or whatever. In so many ways, you just don't know how the Holy Spirit wants to land on that for someone else in the room. So I would encourage you to come share that. I, I'm going to share my story. Okay, no problem. Yeah. No problem. Uh, so this is actually, Molly was like, I don't know if it, it, it's not my story. It's my friend's story. But it was encouraging to me uh, because of just how cool the Lord is. And so I was meeting with a friend for coffee this week. And, um, and he was telling me, I looked at his shoes and, um, I know the, the brand of shoes cause they have kind of a weird shape to them. Uh, they're, they're called Keen. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Keen shoes, but whatever, they have this weird shape. And I had a pair, uh, years ago and I really liked them. I'm like, Hey, you've got Keen's on. And he's like, Oh, these are the only shoes that I wear. And I said, Oh, that's, you know, interesting, whatever. And he said, but I've got a cool story about it. And he said, uh, he said like four years, three, four years ago, he was having massive trouble with his feet. Like first, I don't even know what the issue was. He didn't tell me what it was, but he said, I was having all kinds of trouble with my feet. It hurt to walk all the time. And so that was happening. And he said he was sitting in like a, a little Bible study, uh, and it, when he was sitting in the Bible study, he was thinking, I need to get new shoes that are going to help my feet. I got to figure something out. So he's thinking this. And then kind of out of the blue, in the middle of this group, there was a guy who he thought never, I mean, in his experience, this guy really wasn't a type of a person to hear God's voice or to share prophetically or to really take chances in any way, shape or form. But as Uh, my friend was thinking, I need to get new shoes. This guy kind of stopped the meeting and he said, I feel like God is telling me that I need to buy you new shoes. And he was like, oh my goodness, that's crazy. I was just thinking about that. So he bought him this pair of Keens and after a week, all of his foot trouble went away. He was healed. And I was like, that's a completely cool story. I love how the Lord can do these just absolutely amazing things. So even though it wasn't my miracle, I got energized from Mm -hmm. just how God can do, how he can speak and how he can move, especially when somebody is obedient. So that was was kind of fun for me. Yeah, 
if we don't put it through our filter of like, this is just me, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Silly thing like shoes. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So we'd love to hear from you guys. We then we'll so we'll have our announcement time and then the sermon. So we're going to do that in some prayer today. So yeah, that will still be happening. So um, so one thing I wanted to do with you guys, I, you're probably bored with this but it's important to us. And so one thing I wanted to, because we have like extra space and extra time, um, I wanted to talk about our flames again with you. And I wanted to, because we have the time, I wanted like to like develop this a tiny little bit with you guys because it's so important to the life of this church. So you guys have all heard about flames, right? Every single one of you, not one of you is not. Okay, those of you at home, hopefully you've been hearing about flames. So here's, here's the deal about these flames, okay? So we have spent uh, the better part of a year praying about, wrestling with, and trying to figure out what is it that is really, what, what are we about as a church? What are we trying to do here at Thrive? And we kind of, the Lord sort of like clarified that this is the work of the church here at Thrive. This is what you're trying to do. And so really what we are trying to do with these flames, the flames are a picture of, of spiritual things that we feel God is calling us to do, okay? And so the way that I sort of think of them, the flames, is these are fires that we are trying to light into your heart. These are fires that we are trying to light in your life. And what we've kind of come to believe, you guys, is that if all of these flames are growing in your life, you will be growing as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. You will live in an impactful life. Your life will be changed. It will be transformed, and it will be transformative if all of these flames are growing in your life. But if any one of these flames are not functional, if any one of these things, these spiritual things, are not happening in your life, we would say that there is a major deficit in your relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? You guys with me on this? So the first one, you guys, is Ignite, right? And so um, can anybody venture a guess at what the Ignite flame actually is about? What would you say? Anybody want to? I know it's, it's taking a risk because most times when I, when I say that, people tell me something like, well, it's close, but not quite. What were you going to say, Julie? Nope, that's coming up though. It's not Holy Spirit. I know it feels like it should be Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Hang in there. Holy Spirit is coming. All right. You want me to say it, guys? Oh, wait. Yeah. Lillian. Nope. Nope. <laughs> All right. I'm going to tell you guys. Good idea. It's this good. is why we're doing this. Ben? No. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 our, that's further our... down the line. This is all, it, somebody's going to go, Jesus, is it Jesus? What if, Jesus, Lexi, yeah, your heart, your passionate relationship with Jesus, your connection with him, your friendship with him, that there is an igniting, like, kind of like first love, right? For By the way, we God. did, we had the same conversation with our staff about two months ago. We'd been doing this for like a year and a half. It, it went the just the same, the exact same, 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 <laughs> so with our staff. This is why we, <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. This, this is why we do alignment talks, right? Okay, so the first flame, Ignite, is igniting a vibrant, passionate relationship with Jesus. Okay, so when somebody says to you, how is your relationship with God? That's Ignite. Does that make sense? If somebody says, how are you doing with the Lord? That's Ignite. They were, they're asking you, and what we would be asking you is, how is your connection with God? Are you spending time with him? Do you feel close to him? Do you feel his presence? Do you feel his power? You know what I mean? What is your daily interaction and the experience of that? How is that going, mm -hmm. right? And so we couldn't say that we're doing good work as a church if you guys don't have an ignited, vibrant relationship with Jesus. That's the point of this. And so we do all kinds of activities around here to help you to have a great relationship with the person of God. What kind of activities? Um, so, you know, like in teaching out of the Bible, for example, encouraging you guys to pray, encouraging you to read the word, encourage, like helping you come into contact with Jesus, even through like some of our prophetic stuff, anything that we can do to stir up relationship with God, that's all sort of in the ignite. What would you say about that? 
I would say our worship room that is the second and fourth Tuesday of the month okay. is really geared towards that encountering that um, personal relationship with Jesus to stir that back up, to keep that really like front and center. Our yeah. worship on Sunday mornings, um, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. yeah. And you guys know as well as I do that there are moments in our life, there are seasons in our lives where we're more deeply connected to God. There are seasons where we feel further from him, but the goal is that we would have this ignited, powerful, relational connection with Jesus. That's what the first flame is about. Are we clear? On fire. On yeah, fire. fire. So we're, we want to light that flame of relationship with Jesus. Okay, the second one is activate. Julie, what's activate? It's the same answer as you said. That's yeah. it. So activate, guys, is this, is this is a little bit unique to Thrive. I consider Thrive, uh, to be honest with you, I consider Thrive to just be a biblically Trinitarian church. I think that many, uh, many in the church, you know, kind of worldwide are actually, you know, father and son or father, son and Bible or something like that. But if we understand scripture correctly, um, God is three persons. And the way our conduit to the power of God, the presence of God, uh, even that intimate stuff is through the person of the Holy Spirit. And so our relationship with the Holy Spirit, our um, experience of the Holy Spirit, it is a vineyard distinctive. It makes us different than many of the churches that you will go to. And so we have to lean into it. This is a flame for us, right? We're trying to light the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit brings us to a greater level of intimacy with Jesus. The Holy Spirit puts power on us to do the work of the kingdom. The Holy Spirit uh, gives us, pours out gifts, you know, spiritual gifts so that we can build up the church so that we could reach the lost. The Holy Spirit, um, you know, shapes and forms our character. And so we have to, I believe you guys, as an ex-Catholic, we have to sort of, I mean, how many of us didn't come out of a Pentecostal or a charismatic background, right? Many of us. Mm -hmm. That means that for us, we have to kind of lean in to the person, the Holy Spirit, in some ways, I feel like just to sort of get a baseline connection. Does that make sense? Some, there's some things in faith where you have to work extra hard just to, to get to that starting block a little bit. For, sometimes for me, evangelism can be that way, right? Where it's like, if I don't think about it, I'm probably not sharing my faith. So I have to be really, really purposeful about it. So here at Thrive, it is really important for us that we light the flame of the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. That's why we are who we are. And if you come out of a different church background, you might go, whoa, there's like a lot of Holy Spirit here. And I would say there's not more here than there was in the Acts church. There's not more here than there was in the, in the life of Jesus. And so we are striving as a church to, be, to come into contact specifically with the person, the Spirit, with the gifts of the Spirit, with the power of the Spirit, because the Spirit is the conduit of God. Is that, you guys with me on that? So that's why we pray, come Holy Spirit. That's why we take time in the, in the, during the service. There are people that are um, they're on ministry team that day to be listening for what God might be saying, if he has something specific that he wants to do in someone's life. It's why we take time to do our healing, healing and prophetic nights. We pray for healing. We're reaching for the kingdom. We're reaching mm -hmm. for those things that only God can do. Yeah. So our work as a church is to ignite a vibrant relationship with Jesus. That's our first flame. Our work as a church is to activate the person and the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's what we're about. And again, I always go back and I think, okay, what would a Christian's life look like if you just took out the, the activate flame? What would your life look like if you didn't have a deep connection with the person, the Holy Spirit? What would your life look like if there was no spiritual gifts, if there was no power? Your life would be at a major deficit. And so that's how we know that this is crucial, that this is a flame that's worth giving ourselves for. Okay, that's the second one. What's the third flame? Grow. Grow. Okay. Now, <laughs> this is the trickiest of all of them. Would anybody want to make, make a guess at what our grow flame is about? Good, good, good answer. <laughs> yes. It's about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's about growing. Okay. Yes, Lillian, give it a shot. Uh, growing in, your, in the gifts. Which gifts? Gifts of Holy Spirit. Okay. Gifts, whatever. All the gifts. All the gifts. Yes, all right. the gifts. <laughs> okay, all right. 
Well, what we are growing in is an absolute gift to us, and the grow flame is growing, listen, this is the key phrase, it's growing in personal wholeness. Okay, so here's what we mean by that. Growing in personal wholeness. Now, what I'm talking about is spiritual and emotional health and maturity. Our grow flame is we're growing kind of as people. Okay, so here's something that I think has been largely, are you guys with me? You guys with me? What has been largely ignored in the church, I think that the church to its fault has believed that if you show up to church on Sunday morning and you go to your small group and you, you know, read your Bible, that the inner person in you will be healed, like totally healed. And from that point on, you won't have uh, an inclination towards addictive behavior. You're going to have a great marriage. You're going to relate to, to people that, you know, maybe rub you the wrong way. You're going to relate to them in a very healthy way. And what we've discovered, you guys, is that the emotional uh, maturity, the emotional health that makes us be able to relate to our spouse as well, that makes us be able to understand and be peaceful in ourselves, that stuff actually doesn't really get healed by church attendance. It doesn't. And that's why we spent so much time over the last year doing emotionally healthy spirituality. That's why we do emotionally healthy relationships is because what we've come to realize is that we need to give special care to our inner person because if we don't pay attention to it, if we don't work on our healing, that's what we talk about a lot, we will continue to repeat the same broken patterns over and over and over again. And Molly and I are a testimony of that. Do you want to just share like what our history was like before we started working on this stuff? Um, or do you want me to do it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're rolling, you're rolling. Okay, okay. So, so, so in, in our history, okay, go. No. <laughs> Once uh, upon a time. In our history, Molly and I, um, we spent, actually, I had this like epiphany when we had been married around the seven year mark or so. After about seven years, I can't remember exactly how long it was, but I was like getting nostalgic and I was thinking about the years when we had first gotten married and I was like, man, I just miss those days when we were just raw and young married and all that stuff. And Molly got this like kind of confused look on her face and I was like, oh no, what's, what's that mean? And so I said, what do you, what's going on with you? And she said, don't you know that for the first like two years of our marriage, I was completely miserable? like totally miserable with you. And I, w I just could not believe what she was saying. And then she began to like share with me like my hard heartedness, my anger, all of these things that I didn't even recognize. And so that was like a eye opening conversation to me. I had no idea um, of what her experience was like being married to me early on. But the story wasn't done yet because we didn't do much about it then. We just kind of tried to throw hard work in church at it, and we actually didn't get very far. And so probably seven years ago or so, we had come to a point in our marriage where things were so intense because we did ministry together, we did kids together, we did marriage. Things had gotten so intense that we were our pain point was so high that we were like, we gotta do something about this. And so we started going to counseling together and counseling individually, and then we started working on stuff here at Thrive. And what we've come to believe, you guys, is that hearts don't get healed by normal church activities. You have to actually work on your healing. You have to give it special attention. And so personal wholeness that grow, like we're growing as people, that flame is all about getting our hearts healed about getting our hearts to a place where they're healthy, where we can be forgiving and understanding when people hurt us, where we can have peace in our own hearts, where we can relate to God in a healthy way, where we can relate to each other in a healthy way. That's what that flame is about. And again, it saddens me because I haven't heard much about this until recently in any church, but it's important that we do this because, and here's my last piece on this, and it's this, my personal belief, you guys, is that you understand, you guys know the fruit of the Spirit, right? In Galatians, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Tell me some of the fruit. Yep. Right. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, right? Those things, that fruit of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't come by osmosis. 
I don't think the fruit of the Spirit comes from by showing up at church on Sunday. I don't think that the fruit of the Spirit even, maybe we get a little bit from smaller gatherings, but mostly the fruit of the Spirit will come as we work on our hearts and as we invite the Holy Spirit to heal us and as we get good counsel and we deal with the stuff that is inside us. So if you want an abundant life, if you want that stuff, the fruit of the Spirit at work in your life, then you need to work on your growth. And that's what we're going to do here at church. That's why we've spent so much time at this. Make sense? All right, Molly, do you want to tackle the next one? Engage. Okay. When we talk about engage, who you guys heard us talk a lot about some of the ways that we move towards our community. So when we want to engage, we are engaging the poor. We're engaging our city, our neighbors, those outside the walls of the church. So I think in some ways we can think about engage or we engage here inside the building. Well, no, no, no. This is all about what happens outside the church. And so this is why we have committed to a long-term relationship of walking with our neighbors at Rand Grove and sowing and sowing financially, sowing relationally in prayer and the spirit. People show up there and have done prayer walks. We have people that um, when they're doing their food pantry, the joy drop, they are praying. They're come, they come armed with prayer. Um, so we really long to do what Jesus did, to restore the poor, to seek and save the lost, to see um, the kingdom come, you know, that, that really that mission of Jesus to go out and uh, to see heaven come to all the world. So we uh, really, really have a high value for Engage. I, I really do believe that the Holy Spirit was a, was a power to witness, right? To go do the work of Jesus, which um, right there at the heart of that is just bringing in, bringing in for the outsider in. So, um, so we engage, we engage our world. Okay, so I, I, I didn't hear it, but we have two prongs to engage, right? Yep. Okay, what are the two prongs of engage? The okay, poor. the first one is restore the poor. We are engaging with the poor and the broken and the disenfranchised outside of our, uh, the walls of our church. That's one way that we engage. And the other prong of engage, there's two, is through evangelism. Jesus called us to seek and save the lost. And so our specific evangelistic efforts, that is how we engage with the world. So we engage with the people outside of the walls of the church by caring for the poor outside of the walls of the church and by seeking and saving the lost, by doing the work of evangelists. We are called to fulfill the Great Commission as a church, and so we have to be doing both of those. And once again, I want to remind you, if we took away our engaged flame, would we be fully activated Christians? If we didn't do that work, if we didn't care for the poor, if we didn't seek and save the lost, would we be fully, would we be fully uh, you know, like, would all the pistons be firing in our lives? No, right? And so that's how we know that this is crucial to us, right? So those are the flames. You guys got the flames now? There's one little piece left. What is it? The, the, the gather. gather. And what, what, is, what is gather symbolic of? What, do you, what is it? Is it a flame? Coals. Coals. Okay, so what does this mean? This is one that somebody has to get in this room. What's that about? Community. Community. Yes. Yay. All right. So these coals, right? What goes underneath the flame? The thing that helps light all of this stuff up, the thing that stirs all of this up is the coals. It's our being together. And the picture that we had of this, you guys, was that if you have one, let's say you have a fire and you've got coals underneath it. You've seen this, right? Those things are red hot. But what happens if you took a tongs and you took one of those coals and you put it outside the fire for 10 minutes? What would happen to that coal? goes out. Mm -hmm. It gets cold. And that's what happens. This is why COVID has grieved me so much as a pastor is because I have seen so many people get separated from community, separated from being with you guys. And when they do, so often their hearts get cold. They start to lose their faith. So many people have deconstructed their faith, whatever you want to call that. And it's because they didn't get to be with you guys. That's why showing up to church every Sunday morning is so crucial. You need one another. You don't need me necessarily or Molly. I guess you do. But you need each other just as much. You've got to rub shoulders with each other. You have to encourage each other. That's why small gatherings, our thrive groups are so important because it is through that being together that all of these other flames are actually really transmitted to you. 
right? And so I want to just encourage us that we would not be the church and we won't be fully functioning followers of Jesus unless we are regularly and purposefully spending time together. And so I want to just challenge you to, to think about, hey, I need to be a person that is always around other believers so that I can give what I have to give and so that I can receive what God wants to give to me. Does that make sense? All right. So How one question that people commonly have they want to know, oh, yeah. is there an order? This is, you know, is there a hierarchy to these things? Do right. they go in an order? Nope. You? No, there's not. So all of these are, are truly important. So we don't see them as, as like the top one down to the bottom. No, these, we just take these all as the complete package for what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so just again, the reason, I'm really glad that we had this talk and glad we had this time. And for those of you that just, that walked in a little bit late, we don't have worship leaders today. I think this might be the first time in Thrive's history that we literally don't have a single one of our worship leaders available. So we're doing kind of family talk here. But this is important stuff. And again, these are the flames that we're trying to light in your life. And what I would encourage you to do is on a semi-regular basis, I would encourage you to just, you know, like have these things written down and ask yourself. This is like good if you're a leader here at Thrive or just for your own personal devotional life, ask yourself, how am I doing in each one of these flames? You could look at Ignite and say, how's my connection with Jesus been lately? How am I, am I feeling connected? Am I feeling like, like, like there's intimacy there? Am I feeling like there's power there? Am I, or Jesus and I, am I growing closer to him? Or have I stagnated? Am I falling away? Ask yourself how you're doing with the Ignite Flame. Ask yourself, how am I doing with the Activate Flame? Have I been leaning into the person, the Holy Spirit? Do I, am I asking God for power? Am I praying for the sick to be healed? Am I using the spiritual gifts? It's a great conversation for you to have with the Lord. It's a great way to kind of assess how you're doing in your walk with God. Number three, the grow flame. This is, this is a big one. This is a well, right? And it would be good for you to ask yourself, and I'm, I'm looking at you guys, I know a lot of you guys have worked on your own hearts, but ask yourself, am I growing uh, increasingly to be healthy on the inside? Am I, am I mature as a follower of Jesus? Or do I still have, am I still wrestling with addictive, addictive behavior? Am I still wrestling with bitterness of heart or unforgiveness? Does my spouse continue to complain about the same routine behavior in my life over and over and over again? So do that assessment for yourself. You know, the engaged flame. Are you doing the work of an evangelist? Are you caring for the poor? Or do you let somebody else do that? all the time. And then finally, are you here? Are you gathering? Are you connected to a Thrive group? We're going to be launching Thrive groups uh, in, in September, and there's going to be all kinds of opportunities for you to spend some time, purposeful time, growing in your relationship with God and blessing people around here. And it's our hope and our desire that you would engage deeply in that so that you can grow and become everything that God has you to be. Make sense? All right. Okay. All right. So um, Kevin's going to lead us through a psalm. We're going to pray a psalm as just kind of a different um, channel for worship. While you're doing that, I'd love again for you guys to kind of just be thinking about, is God bringing a story, a God story um, to mind that you can share with us to be a blessing to, to each other here? Like a two-minute just story of how you've seen God's kingdom break in, how he's reached you, how he's spoken to you, through you, how he's moved in your life. We'd love to just open it up for people to share a testimony. But Kevin's going to pray a psalm. Um, I don't know if anyone has elementary school kids, but there are, there are bags in the back for them um, for this time. We will dismiss you um, after our worship time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, hey, why don't we stand for this little bit, you guys? And we are going to, we're just going to praise God with our hearts. We're going to praise God in our spirits. We're going to praise God with our words. And so this will be, this will be worship to God. Um, it'll just, have a different feel. It'll, it'll have a different sound. Maybe a lot of it will be internal, but I would encourage you, you can even pray out loud. And, um, and I'll, I'll even give you the opportunity, if you feel God stirring up just a praise or a thanks or, or something along those lines, um, I'll be happy to like, you know, loan you the mic for 30 seconds or something like that so you can share that. But I'm going to read this psalm. I'm going to pray for a second, then we're going to read it. Alex, I think uh, we have the words. 
And so this is from Psalm 45, but let me just pray. Let's just offer our hearts to Jesus right now. Let's offer our hearts to the Lord. We're just going to worship him in our hearts. We're going to worship him with just the praises of our mouth. But um, Father God, I am so thankful that we get this time to praise you and to worship you in a different way. I actually know that while this feels like a conundrum in our planning, this is of your orchestration, Lord. Lord, thank you that we get to engage uh, you and engage you in a different place in our hearts with a different gear. And so, Lord, we just love you this morning. We bless you this morning. We give you our hearts. We give you our praise. Lord, our lives are, are lived for your glory because you are worthy of it. Lord, you are good. You are kind. You are majestic. You are so present with us, Lord. Lord, thank you that you called each one of us by name. Thank you that you know the number of the hairs on our heads. Lord, thank you that you know us in the deepest places of our lives. Lord, thank you for your incredible and unending love to us, that your love never changes. On our good days or our bad days, your love never changes. You are utterly and completely faithful. Lord, we worship you this morning. I'm going to start reading Psalm 145. You can read it behind me if you want to. David writes, I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Lord, we praise you. Great is the Lord. He is worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. And Lord, I just pray that for us right now, that we would be a people that have your character and your mighty acts on our hearts and on our tongues, that we would sing your praises, the praises of your greatness, the praises of your glory, the praises of your character. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor, and on your wonderful miracles, your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. Here it is. The Lord is merciful and compassionate. He is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. How many of us need that this morning? The Lord is merciful and he is compassionate and he is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. Lord Jesus, we glorify you. Thank you, Father, that that is who you are. We need your unfailing love. We need your mercy, Lord. We cry out for it, Lord. Thank you that you are merciful. Thank you that your love never fails us. Your love never falters. It never slips up. It never goes to sleep, Lord. Lord, we are the glad and needful recipients of your love. We are the needful recipients of your mercy. And, and right now, Lord, we just receive it. Sometimes praise is just in receiving Sometimes praise is in saying, yes, Lord, that is exactly what I need right now. Holy Spirit, would you come and just minister to each one of us the mercy of God, the unfailing love of God. Come, Holy Spirit, just fill us right now. I'm just going to be quiet. It'll be really quiet in the, in the room. But I'm just going to allow the Holy Spirit for a moment to just minister the mercy of God the unfailing love of God to your heart right now. Give us more, more of you, Lord, or allow us to give you more of us, Holy Spirit. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. 
all of your works will thank you, Lord. That's amazing. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom, and they will give examples of your power. Lord Jesus, we pray together that we would be a people that would be able to give examples of your power in our lives, that we would be able to tell the story, not just of your reality, not just of what the word says, Lord Jesus, but that we would be a people that have experienced your power and that we would tell the stories of your overcoming, overwhelming power in our lives, Lord Jesus. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and the glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. You ruled in the generation before us. You ruled in the generation before that and the one before that. And you will rule in the generation that comes after us and the one that comes after that and the one that comes after that. Lord, thank you that you are God and owner and keeper of time, that you are God and owner and keeper of all the generations that have come before us and will come after us, Lord Jesus. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And the Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all that he does. The Lord helps the fallen and he lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all look to you in hope. You give them their food as they need it. And when you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and the thirst of every living thing. Just take that in, church. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and the thirst of every living thing. We receive you, Lord. Thank you that you fill us that you satisfy our hunger and our thirst for you, that you satisfy our hunger and our thirst for righteousness, for your kingdom to come and your will to be done in our lives. You satisfy the hunger and the thirst of every living thing. And we've talked quite a bit about that recently here at Thrive, and, and we just pray again that you would stir up an increased hunger and an increased thirst for you, for your glory, for your honor, for your will to be done in this world and in us and through us, Lord. The Lord helps the fallen and he lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all look to you in hope. You give them their food as they need it. And when you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and the thirst of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all that he does, and he is filled with kindness. Thank you that you are a God of kindness. You are not capricious. You are not uncaring. You are not above us in some hard way. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are a God of kindness. In everything that you do, the Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears the cries for help and he rescues them. Their cries for help and he rescues them. Listen to this. The Lord protects all those who love him, but he destroys the wicked. And Lord, we together, we just pray that wherever there is uh, the work of the enemy in the world, wherever there's the work of the enemy in our lives, Lord, we pray that you would destroy the work of the wicked, that you would tear down the strongholds of the enemy as we experience it, as people in our family experience it, as our friends experience it, as those in, a, uh, in our country and in the world experience it. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you destroy the wicked, and we pray that you would, Lord Jesus, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth and in us just as it is in heaven. And David closes this psalm and he says this, I will praise the Lord. 
I will praise the Lord, and may everyone on earth bless his holy name forever and ever. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord Jesus, right now. This is our praise this morning. We offer you our worship, our voice to you. Did you have something you wanted to pray right away? Does anybody, um, yeah? Could we bring the bar family up? Oh, you want to do that? talk about, yeah, just... Could we, yeah, just, I feel like there's so much of this psalm, like just being able to go and speak yeah. about the power of, of God. Why don't you guys sit down and we're going to bring the Barth family up. Um, and then when they're done, their kids, you, your kids can go on down. But why don't you guys okay. come on up and talk about a little bit about what God's doing in this next season and, and where he's taking you. And those yeah, you have the busy yeah. bags, right? All right. All right, All right here we go. Going on up? All right. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everyone. So uh, for those of you that don't know us, if you're a little bit newer, so we're the Barth family. I'm Jonathan. This is Lexi. These are our two oldest uh, children. This is Gigi, Novali, and then you probably see us with uh, two other little ones around, Lucy and Rafferty. Um, so they're both being watched right now, but uh, we're just so excited. We've been a part of Thrive now for seven years. Uh, seven years is a long time. That's like a couple of, like presidents ago, right? Like, and, like a lot of time flies. So we originally uh, met, Lexi and I met in Florida. Um, we were part of a vineyard down there. So for those of you that don't know, as Kevin mentioned earlier, uh, the vineyard's like a global association to churches, right? They have a national association too, and, and uh, they have a, just a true value, like a real value for really getting to the heart of Jesus and really the Holy Spirit as well and, and, and the Word, right? Like those are all things that like we're rooted in. It's our firm foundation. And so uh, Lexi and I, when we first uh, started dating, we both had just felt um, a calling to missions. Lexi had actually been on some missions. I'll let her maybe talk about that in a second. Um, but for both of us, we knew that we there was just a calling in our lives to serve. We felt just so compelled. I came to uh, Jesus uh, as a 17-year-old, also ex-Catholic, right? I knew nothing of the Holy Spirit other than, you know, like the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, just doing the sign of the cross. And uh, when I felt that activation, just as we talked about the, um, you know, the, the flames here, it, it just wrecked me. It, it wrecked me. It wrecked, like, my goals for my life. Like, the things that I wanted to do in my life, it just changed everything uh, dramatically. And so just seeing that Lexi had already been, you know, participating in things like missions, and, and she'd been overseas, she'd been to India and to Cuba and all these other countries, I was just, like, blown away. I was like, I, I want part of that in my life. And so uh, uh, we did some um, uh, seminary together too, online seminary. We actually had a cohort. Um, we had really felt, what, after we got married, we had really felt like we wanted to serve and, and continue to serve in our church, uh, be part of what uh, the church was doing, uh, reaching the nations. We even just in the last few weeks had just discovered a lot of old words that we felt like God had given us. Um, you know, through each other, through others that we had written down about serving uh, the nations uh, over the years. So we're actually shifting in our lives. We're going to be shifting into a season where we're going to go as a family into international missions. So that's something that is relatively recent for those of you that have been around us. You know, it's kind of new news, um, kind of a shock for our family. Uh, we've been uh, pretty entrenched here at Thrive now. Uh, so going back to when we first started coming, um, you know, we came up with a little bit of change in our pockets and uh, we were about to have Novali. So Novali had, hadn't been born yet. So we were, uh, it was just us and Gigi and Novali was on the way. and. God just poured out his favor, like after giving us words of like where we were going to end up, you know, through, you know, dreams and through others, like the gather aspect of, of the flames there too, right? Others were giving words into our lives about um, moving to Chicago and getting plugged into a church in Chicago. Um, even the national director of the vineyard, you know, at the time, his name was Phil Strout. I, I was in a crowd and he looked right at me and said, we need churches in Chicago. And he like pointed right at me he, and it was like crazy. I was like blown away um, before we even came to know Kevin and Molly. 
And, uh, and long story short, we were just faithful to that word. We said, okay, God, if this is what you're up to, you're going to help us find a way to do this. And so we did. We made it up here. Um, we got plugged in uh, to some small groups early on, and there was just opportunity. And we're like, hey, where can we get plugged in? And so over the years, um, you know, at first I was working a lot of crazy retail hours. I was just doing what I could to help provide. So I was like not able to serve on Sundays for a while. I was not able to like be around even on Sundays. So people probably thought Lexi was here going solo with her kids, uh, which was, you know, not the case long term. So thankfully that changed after a while. Um, but she was uh, able to plug into the kids' ministry. Uh, so she did that for four years, working with the elementary school kids and the young kids. Um, so many of you that have kids that have been brought up, you know, they, they were probably with Lexi for a while. Um, after a little while, too, I had kind of just felt this nudge. There was uh, an opportunity with the youth uh, here, and I had just, I was working full time. I really felt super busy, and I could not shake the just this tug from the Holy Spirit. It was a Holy Spirit thing. I even called Kevin. We met for like lunch one day. Um, I think we got some subs or something. I told him, Kevin, I can't shake this feeling. I just feel like like the, you know, there's no youth people right now, or, we, or you guys are figuring out the youth person. I just feel like I just I needed to step up and do something here and help, and uh, that turned into a four-year mission. What was like a part-time? Hey, here's a stopgap. It turned into like a four-year commitment. And um, Lexi did the kids stuff for five years, and we overlapped doing that. And we just were so blessed in that time. Um, God showed up so often in our lives too, just taking what little we had and um, and pouring out His Spirit on the kids and the youth and the things that we were involved in. And so that kind of led to here in the last couple of years, we've just been trying to be faithful to um, what the Holy Spirit would have for our family, for raising our family. Um, you know, we've been obviously navigating all the just craziness of the last couple of years, all the COVID stuff, just being together as a family unit. What does that mean for us in our lives? And um, one verse that really stood out to me that's like stuck out since I was young was Romans 12.1. And Paul just, he's, he's telling the church at the time, Therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Um, but that's true and pleasing worship to God. And uh, for those of you that don't know me very well, I love music. I was part of a music program before I came to know Jesus and um, was like really on fire for music. Like I was going to go into school, uh, school to do music. And uh, when I came to know the Lord, I really came, became captivated with worship music. And um, that t took a back burner sometimes over the years for me, like when there was other opportunities to serve. And uh, even recently, there was some pretty amazing things that have happened in our lives where, you know, opportunities have come up for me to participate more in worship. So I'll let Lexi share a little bit about what's been happening in our lives. But I, um, I really feel that just honoring God through God all right, what do you want to do in our lives? It's a really dangerous prayer, but that's, to me, true worship. It's sacrifice, right? We sacrifice for the things that we worship, and if, you know, we are following God and we are putting God first in our lives, we're going to make the biggest sacrifices for him, and we're in the midst of that now. So I'll let Lexi share a little bit about how we came to this decision and what we're going to be doing going forward. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Thrive has just been um, these last few years since moving. We don't have family in the area, so um, Thrive has really just surrounded us. And as we jumped in, like Jonathan was saying, and we got in small groups and just um, being in leadership under Kevin and Molly, and I'm going to try to get emotional. <laughs> um, it just has been um, such an amazing time to be under their leadership and their guidance and their prayer in our life when we really needed that. We've been through some really hard seasons um, just with some health things and different things over the years that um, Kevin and Molly and just thrive as a whole and our small groups and different things have really come alongside of us and walked through that with us. So um, I miss the flames, some of the flames when I was <laughs> in the back with Rafferty. The engaged flame, is that small groups? <laughs> Calls the gather. Oh, okay. Gather. So, okay. So, the small groups are so important just as you go through those seasons in your life. They come alongside you and they pray and they are just um, loving on you. And so, just as we walked through that with Thrive, and um, it's just been such a blessing and spiritual formation just in our life um, and our family. So, um, 
the last like year. Um, we really started praying in the beginning of the year. We felt like God was shifting things in our life, and we weren't really sure what that meant. So we really started just praying, okay, God, like, what do you have for us? Like, what is this next season? Um, we had a baby. Um, he's eight months, and I had stepped down from kids' ministry to really focus on just being a mom and some other things. And we were just ready to, we were just praying about where, like, what do you have for us? And so we weren't really sure what that was going to look like, but we were just pressing in and sales up and ready for God to kind of move. And so in the beginning of the year, we really felt like we should list our house and get our house kind of ready to start listing and the cleaning out process and all of that. And with not really knowing what was coming. And we were just like, okay, we're going to just, we're going to just say yes to that and not knowing. And Molly's message last week was so great because we've had some Noah words of just like, we don't really know what we're doing or what the plan is or what's coming next, but we're just saying yes to God. And we're just saying, okay, God, we're just going to be faithful in what you ask us today. And like, you're asking us to get our house ready and to sell and to do these things. And we got under contract and we still didn't have a really an idea of kind of, you know, we were talking about some things that maybe we wanted to do as a family, but it didn't feel like it was under what God was kind of pressing us towards. And so as we press more into that, there was a few weeks back when um, Molly preached a message about just loving people and actually in worship before her message, God laid on my heart just missions again. And some of the conversations just internally was like, you know, doing that with a family, like how does that work? And like, what does that look like? And, you know, Jonathan has a full-time job and all of the organizations that I know of or I've been a part of is like, you just are all in and it would be really tricky to like work and do things. So we weren't sure. We met with Kevin and Molly and we were just like brainstorming and praying and like this is some of the things God's laying on our heart. And um, and so about three weeks ago, we were in this place of still not really sure. We wanted to kind of move into missions, but not knowing all the pieces. And then out of the blue, um, Jonathan got a call and his company downsized and completely um, laid off his whole department. Um, I think they kept maybe one person, but his um, role was completely just taken out of his company. Just that day, they were like eight in the morning and just, you're not working today. And so for us, it was obviously, yes, that's huge. And it takes a couple of days we were processing and walking through that, but we had already, God had already been priming us and had already been showing up. And so we were like, you know, that for us felt like, okay, God, that is the shift we needed to really feel the peace and the confidence of you really are calling us into this um, this life of missions. And so that's kind of um, the direction we're taking. And so we applied um, and got accepted to YWAM Norway. And so we are going to be going in September um, through with YWAM. And literally since the day um, we applied, um, there's been serious spiritual warfare happening just over our family. Um, so we really need your guys' prayers just for protection over us and protection over our health. Um, there's just been, it's just been nonstop, I feel like, um, over the last, especially the last two weeks. So, um, which is all good. We're like, you know what, God, you're up to something. Like, your protection is on us and you are moving and we are just saying yes. And we are so excited to just see God move in our kids and in our family and in Thrive. Like, this is, um, you guys get to be a part of this. So, all of this to say, we want you guys to be praying for us, please, just protection and where God will show up and where God will use us um, because we couldn't be where we are without um, so many of you guys just pouring into us and our kids. And, um, and so we will be um, communicating in the next few weeks of how you can follow along um, with what we're doing um, and what God is doing. And we can share all the great God stories of how he's going to show up and use us and really ultimately just use Thrive internationally. And so, um, yeah, so be on the lookout through the newsletter and stuff that's going to be coming. And then if you'd like to support us with donations and everything, you can give through Thrive. And, um, and yeah, and we would love that. Just um, all of those will go towards travel costs and just taking care of our kids and, um, and our family. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We Oh, one more thing right before I think we're going to pray. Sorry. We are having a... Um, 
family fun park meetup today. Oh, it's, it's up, up here. Great. Yeah. So after church today, it's in Fox River Grove. Um, grab a picture so you can figure out where it is. Um, and we are going to be just playing some games and hanging out. It's a huge park. And um, yeah, we have some gift cards we're going to raffle and just kind of a last. We are closing on our house this week. And then we're actually going to go stay with some family in Florida for a few weeks before we head out in September. So um, we'd love to see everyone and we can talk more and share more we have like we were talking on the way here and I'm like we can't share all of it there's like so many verses and things that God's placed so we'd love to just yeah share more and talk more and you guys can ask questions and we'd love just to um like yeah have you guys gather around and um come along with us yeah yes we all right yes 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 we are just so 100% behind what God is doing in your lives. And you guys have been so faithful, so faithful every step of the way, every yes, every, like, I think God might be saying this, and I'm going to step towards that. And it's been so courageous. And I feel like this family, one of the, um, the just the ways that God has pressed in on them, they have an undivided heart is what I would say. They have an undivided heart. And, um, and so it's just been such an honor to come alongside you guys. So Thrive is supporting them um, financially and in prayer and in all the ways, just so you guys know, you know, we are just 100% behind this family. Yeah, and really uh, in prayer, right away i i am not a there's a demon behind every bush type of a person and i have never seen um spiritual warfare against anybody like i've seen with these guys mm -hmm. never um they have encountered one really difficult thing after another just out of nowhere so we really need to cover them uh in our prayer Okay, so I'm going to pray for you guys really quickly right now, and then afterwards, grab them and uh, pray for them, bless them, uh, and they'll be here next week. We'll be there last week. Um, I'm going to miss Gigi's hugs, but uh, the, next week will be their last week, and then uh, they'll be off to uh, the getting transitioned to Norway. So, yeah. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for uh, this amazing family that have poured um, really all of their lives into... Yeah. Um, the call that's been on them into your kingdom, Lord Jesus, in every expression, whether it was children's ministry or youth ministry, the kids, all of it, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, as a church, we speak your blessing and your honor over the Barths, Lord Jesus. We pray for your protection over them. We pray that no more of the schemes of the enemy would be allowed to touch them. And I just pray that instead you would turn everything into an incredible testimony of your faithfulness, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for total healing over Jonathan uh, with the, the, uh, the thing in his ear and the loss of hearing. We pray that that would be done once and for all. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would be deeply impactful in the nations, Lord Jesus. So we love you, and we bless you, and we just thank you for this Barth family. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 All right, love you guys. Yeah. So please come pray for them after. We'll have them come up with the family. All right, we are going to dismiss the kids to kids ministry. I don't know if there's Daniel, and yeah, you guys go down, and uh, there, you guys are going to have a lesson on baptism today, and some of you guys are getting ready to be baptized next Sunday. And that is just my prep for Carly, who's going to come tell you more about what's happening around here uh, in the near future. Woo-hoo! Oh, so much talking. Does everyone need to stand for a second? I know, you've been down for a bit. Feel free. We're going to stand, we'll sit, whatever you guys want to do. So... A uh, couple of administrative things. Firstly, at the back of the at the back of the church today on the welcome table, uh, I have set up our mid-year giving statements. We've never done this before, but now you can have a snapshot as to what you've been tithing to take a peek. So feel free. I've alphabetized them so you can look through real quick and grab yours. Um, if they don't get picked up those of you who are online, then I'll send them out uh, in the mail next week. You can also very conveniently check this information on your phone through church suite yes there's my church suite plug because i always have to talk about it when i'm up here <laughs> but we do have some fun things happening at thrive this week so first of all right after church today downstairs in the cafe we have mission and munchin if you're newer to thrive if you don't know a lot about thrive as a church 
please feel free to come downstairs and have lunch with us and we can talk through all of uh, what's going on here um, outside of the lovely discussion we had this morning. Secondly, uh, we have a school supply drive that's happening to benefit the children of Rand Grove Village. We have had our first donation, yes, and I have to say it was a very fun donation. Uh, a whole ton of student planners. Unfortunately, planner was misspelled. So it is stool planer. <laughs> Hilarious. So we're going to get some vinyl stickers and just cover that right up. It'll look great. But it was a very, very generous and fun donation. So we are collecting this week and we're collecting next week as well. Um, we have about 30 children at Rand Road who have signed up. There are a list of needed items and snack items. The list is again at the back welcome table or downstairs on your way out. Feel free to grab. Um, there are a lot of kids in need at Rangrove right now and I have been asked many, many times if markers and all those little things that have actually gone up with inflation. <laughs> so, uh, so if you're willing, if you're able, please do support the, the school supply drive. Big reminder, Tuesdays is a big night at Thrive now because Worship Room has moved to Tuesday nights. So this coming Tuesday at 7.30, we will have time and space to minister to the Lord and set our hearts and just to be filled by Jesus. So please, if you're able, come and spend time in worship this way. Lastly, I have a lot to say today, but lastly, next Sunday is a great Sunday because it's baptisms! Woo! Woo! We have got several people who are going to be baptized and make that prophetic act um, right outside on our lawn. And, and that includes several of our Thrive kids. So we're very jazzed. So please come with your hearts ready. We're going to have um, baptism time outside. We're going to have our service inside. And then we're doing popsicles afterwards, which, you know, is just fun. So yay, summertime. Okay, well, we're all set. Molly, all right. on. Way to go, Carly. So good. All right. So, um, so Kevin has been doing a funny thing this summer. Um, he, you know, he plays a lot of golf. I think it's a lot of golf, but that's probably in the eye of the uh, budgeter, right? Um, but he's been playing some golf and he plays regularly with one friend, one neighbor. And um, instead now of just going out and enjoying a beautiful weekend morning or a, a sunset, what is it called when it's sunset? Um, twilight round um, and enjoying just the beauty of the environment and keeping track of your his score, you know, like how, how did I do this week or keeping track of maybe like how are my drives today? Are my, am, am I getting long drives like my yardage here, right? Instead of keeping track of just those type of evaluations and like, you know, my front nine versus my back nine. Well, now he has added a whole other tracker beyond just the scorecard on, on the driving wheel there, he's added a tracker and he has a whole nother ledger and he's keeping track of his wins versus his friend. So it's not just about that total score, it is do I come out on top above this one guy, right? And so he has a whole nother spreadsheet where he has his win column and his loss column and, and every time he plays, again, not just about the one score, now there's this whole other level of competition. Do I get to put a tick mark in my win column against this guy, right? And I, and I think about this and I think, you know, this is funny. This is like strange and funny and a whole nother, you know, a whole nother thing where you have a really bad day because you lost to this guy, right? Or a really good day because you beat him. But I, in so many ways, I, I get this. We, we do this in one way or another that there is something in us and we want to keep track of how we are doing compared to people around us. We want a few areas in our life where we know, we wanna know, am I coming out on top here, right? Am I coming out above the others? And I believe that evaluation is just in the core of the human experience. We are constantly evaluating ourselves. Think about this for a second. When you're born at birth, your first moments of life, 
Do you know they give you a score <laughs> on this APGAR scale from one to 10? The first thing that they do with you is they give you a score, a number value. And then they say eight pounds, three ounces, 21 inches long, and they put you on a, in a percentile, don't they? Here's where you measure up. This is the first thing declared over us as people. Right? And I think in so many ways, it just represents the world we live in and the pressures around us. But it doesn't stop there, right? Think about elementary school. And, and honestly, when I think back over my kids' elementary school, what kind of sticks out is the map testing that would happen fall, winter, spring, right? Like, where do you fall? Are you growing? What kind of growth do you have? And then it, it goes on from there, and we spend our whole 15th year of our life prepping for one test, don't we? One test. That driver's test that's coming down, the, right? We, I, this, it, a big, huge focus. I got to pass this test. And then we go, we go on, and in high school, we, you know, the our, we feel like our future depends on what college we get into, and that's based on our ranking, isn't it? How do you compare to your classmates? What's your GPA? How was your test, your SAT, ACT test score compared to everyone else, right? And then we go on and we get a job and we want to know, how do I compare to my co- Am I, am I a good coworker? Is, am I doing well for my boss? Am I performing? Am I, am I a good friend? Am I a good parent? How am I doing as a husband? Am I good at my hobbies, right? We want to know, even in our hobbies, where do I stack up? Am I a good pickleball player? Am I better than that person on the court next to me or not, right? Am I, am I, how many followers do I have in this current moment? And whether we realize it or not, coming out on top somewhere, somewhere or many places is really, really important to us. We want to pass the test with flying colors. Whatever that means, <laughs> we, want, we want it, don't we, right? And this desire, I believe, guys, actually comes from our design. We know that we're made in the image of God and that in that very design is a spirit of excellence isn't it? You think about what God did from the very beginning, in the very beginning the, from creation, right? He stepped back, he made, he made creation, and what did he do at the end of the day? He stepped back and he evaluated it, and he spoke over it, well done, very good, good, very good, that he would look out what he made, and he would say, yes, I did well here, and his, we are made in this image, aren't we? That we too carry the spirit of excellence, and we recognize that there is something in us that we long for that same satisfaction of knowing what I have done is good at the end of the day, and we want a test score like this man, Daniel, in his day of testing, this hero of faith in the Old Testament. And I want us to look for just a minute at his test score and how he did in his day of testing. And we're gonna um, really land for the most part today in the whole, that first chapter of Daniel. So if you have a Bible, I wanna see it. There's some in front of you, open it up. If not, I'll have the scripture here. But here is the day of testing. I want you, as I read this, I want you to look for the evaluation. How did he do on this test? So here's what we read. At the end of the time set by the king for their training, the head of the royal staff brought them, so this is Daniel and his friends, to Nebuchadnezzar the king. When the king interviewed them, here's his day of testing, he found them far superior to all the other young men. None were a match for Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. None were a match. And it goes on to say, so they took their place in the king's service. Whenever the king consulted them on anything, on books or on life, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his kingdom put together. Wow, well done, Daniel. Well done, a test before the king. But do you see what it said there? Found far superior, far superior. None were a match, 10 times better than everybody, the wisest put together. This is a, a test result that is off the charts, isn't it? Daniel, off the charts. And so I want us to go back for a second and look at his prep work. What did he do to prepare for his day of testing, to get a result like that, to be able to say at the end of the day, wow, you know, like, well done, I did this well. What was his prep work like? And what can we learn for our life full of testing? 
for our life full of evaluation because what I want us to do, I feel like this is the call, this has been on my heart recently, is I want us to, to be a people that we can look back and we go, we prepared right, right? Is there anything worse than studying and, and like reading the wrong chapter for the test, right? Like, I thought we were, no, I thought this is what we were doing here. No, no, no. I want us to be a people who are prepared and I want us to get the prep work right. So we're gonna go back and just look, ahead, look before, what came before this, so we can get the preparation right. So here, really quickly, is the background for this prep work. Here's what was happening in this day. There's this King Nebuchadnezzar, and he is out for like world domination. And so he has been going out and conquering surrounding nations, and as he, as he, he would conquer a nation, he would take captive the best of the, that land, and he would take them back to Babylon, to his, uh, his, his uh, kingdom, to his palace, and he would train them and make them be just like the other Babylonians so that they would go rule on his behalf back in these places because he just needed, he needed rulers that were like him that would, that would rule on his behalf. And so this is where we meet Daniel. Daniel is one of these captives as Nebuchadnezzar has come and conquered Israel Jerusalem, he's taken Daniel and, and the best of the land with him and he brought them back to Babylon. And this is what we see in Daniel 1 in verse 4. He, he grabbed the best of that land and Daniel was one of them. And he said this, he said that they, he sent them into training and he gave them, uh, he taught them the language and the literature of the Babylonians and then in verse five, the king assigned them to a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. So this is a training period, and in this training period, it's all focused on teaching uh, language and literature and culture and you know, history and customs of the, the Babylonians, um, and they were taught well, and they were fed well. That's all the information we got. This is how you're gonna become like us. We're gonna teach you well, and we're gonna feed you the best food available in the kingdom. And here's Daniel. He's taken from Jerusalem, which is the center of God worship, Yahweh worship, the one and only true God that he lived for, that, uh, that, that he served, and he's taken and he's forced to this foreign land under this foreign king, this pagan king, and he's forced into this future that's put on him, right? He's taken from his family, his people, his church, his small group, his ways, the future that, that he was heading for, and he is, is forced into a different way of life. He's forced into service, he's forced into a culture that is completely pagan that is like anti-God. It's not neutral, it's anti-God, right? Because God worship is based on the fact, you know, you, one true God, one true God, and he's forced into this, this world of like a thousand gods and all these like rituals, and he's forced into this life. Now, if we just wanna pause for a second. Does this sound like a backdrop for excellence? <laughs> you know, like if you think about this for a second, this seems like this is gonna be an impossible test to pass, Daniel, like you are forced into something that is like wicked and it's evil and, and these people expect this of you and they're defining who you're gonna be and what you're gonna do with your life and, and you know, where we're gonna, they're gonna put you somewhere. It's like, you know, he's just this slave, this captive to this pagan God. And in case we think that all of our circumstances have to line up for something good to happen, if all of our circumstances have to be in place, if we kind of have this expectation, you know what, nothing good is going to happen here. Do you see what's going on in my life right now? Right? If we think that it's all based on our circumstances just ticking along a golden road to be able to do anything of value, to be able to make an impact, to be excellent, well, let's just get some comfort for Dan from Daniel's life from his story here because he chose none of this and it was all anti anything he had ever lived for, right? So that's kind of the backdrop, the backdrop of what happens. And if you're look, following around, along in chapter one, here's the next bit. Here is where we zero in on the prep work. Okay, verse eight, but Daniel determined that he would not defile himself by eating the king's food or drinking his wine. And he decided this. He's like, I am not going to eat this. And so he goes to the guy in charge of his food and he says, listen, I, I don't wanna eat what everyone else is eating. This food has been served to pagan gods. And so he says, listen, do us a favor. I want you to test us. And for 10 days, just give us a simple diet of vegetables and water. 
vegetables and water only. And so the steward agrees, there's favor on him, and the steward agrees and fed him vegetables and water for 10 days, and at the end of the 10 days, they looked better and more robust than all the others who had been eating from the royal menu. Here is the simple one plan track for his prep work. Daniel didn't defile himself with the food that was offered to the pagan gods. He denied himself of this royal table, the food and the drink he could have, and he decided that he wasn't gonna defile himself, which means he was gonna keep himself clean. He was gonna separate himself out from that. And so here is, I see his prep work. It was obedience. Obedience in what he could control in his life. Remember, this, all this Babylonian culture and ways and literature has been pressing, pressing in him and pressing on him. And what could he control? How could he keep himself set apart from God in this moment? Well, well, he could do it, he could keep himself pure by fasting. This is what this was. He was fasting the rich food and the rich drink of the king's table. And I want us to get a little bit deeper here, and this decision wasn't, in case we're wondering, this is not a diet with its natural benefits. This was all about what was going on in Daniel's heart. And in this moment, in his heart, he was um, separating himself out from this pagan culture and he was saying, but my heart is still holding on to the living God. That my heart is still trusting, my heart is still waiting, my heart is still hoping for God in his ways. And this is the only way that I can represent it here in this foreign land, is I can keep my heart pure by, by fasting, by denying myself the, the comfort in the strength and the delight maybe of this this king's table. It was keeping his heart clear. It was keeping it still in worship of the living God in this culture. It was all he could do. And when the test came, he was ready, wasn't he? I mean, guys, I'm not making this up. This is what the scripture says. It goes from this, this bit of prep work right into found superior here. No one, no, out, outplayed everyone. No one was a match in all of the kingdom. And so here's what I want to do, guys. I want to make a case today for us to fast as powerful prep work too. I want to make a case that I, I can't get around. I can't deny what was happening here and the results that God brought so that like Daniel, we can keep our hearts open and clutter free, that we too can see the results uh, of the, the testing that Daniel saw, that we could see results like this in our day, that when we are pressed, that we're pressed, out comes the spirit of the living God. That we are, when we're desperate, when we're in need, and when we're tried, out comes the wisdom of God, the creativity of God, the goodness of God. Out comes something that is way beyond us, our personalities, our abilities, our intellect alone. Out comes what only God could put in. Can we look for just a second at what happens when we fast? So here are a couple fasting foundations. The first and foremost, this is what the heart of fasting is. It's turning from something you can get toward something only God can give. This is what it's all about at the foundation of it. So guys, Daniel had a right to the king's table. He did. He had a right. It was maybe one advantage of the whole terrible situation was lunchtime and dinner time and breakfast, right? It's one perk of being taken to this foreign place. It's one perk of the training that he is going through, right? Remember, he's everything else. He had no choice. It's forced upon him where he's living, his career. But here's the deal. He emptied himself of this perk. He did. He set himself apart. He emptied himself and he could have talked himself into feasting in the season like everyone else. He could have talked, I deserve this, right? Like I deserve, I can have this. This is going to bring, this is going to be good. Like, you know, God gave me taste buds. I use that a lot, (laughs) right? He could have said, I'll just pray before I eat right? Like, does it really matter? It's just food. I mean, I'm swimming in a pagan culture. Does it matter that the food is pagan too, right? But he humbled himself. He humbled himself in obedience to turn down this extravagant food. And as he humbled himself and emptied himself of what he could get, he got what God could give. He got what God could give. And he decided that he actually needed help from God in this season, not what he could get from, from the advantages of the situation. Here's how I know this. Later on, we get a little bit more detail in Daniel 9. 
And this is when Daniel faces another challenge, and this is what it says. He said, then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting in sackcloth and ashes. So here's the, the bottom line of what a, what a fast is like for Daniel. I turn my face to God. I turned my face to God. This is, this is it, this is what he was doing. Away from the comfort and the strength and maybe the distraction of something on earth to, to get what God could give from heaven. Turning towards God in fasting. Seeking him in fasting. And how do we know that he's turning to God for help? in strength and wisdom because it says that he paired his, his, uh, his fast with, do you see this, prayers and pleas. God, I need what you can give. I'm turning to you for your strength, your wisdom, your, you making sense in this terrible circumstance. I need what you have, your perspective. I'm here facing your ability, not mine. And so here's what I see that he did. He paired it up and it's, pair, it's prayers and pleas with his potatoes and peas, right? With his veggie diet. He paired these things together and I'm looking, I'm I'm turning from what I could get to you and you come, I need you here. I need what you can bring. Prayers and pleas with his potatoes and peas. And when, when when we pair fasting, and prayer, guys, we, we see what God breaks in. We see in Isaiah 58. And I'm gonna go through this really fast. But here's Isaiah 58. The whole chapter is about fasting. And it gives us fasting from God's perspective. But I want us to see what happens when we pray and fast. Here's what it says in Isaiah 58. It says this. It says that healing appears. It says, like, look at it. It says, what God, here's what God gives when we empty ourselves. Here, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, here I am. This is the then of fasting. Do you see all these thens? Goodness gracious, the light breaking into the darkness. Anyone feel like there's a little bit of darkness going on in their life or around their life or in their circumstance or in the world? Fast, then the light breaks in. Then healing will appear quickly. Anyone need healing? Anyone know someone who needs healing? Anyone need a lifting of of pain, a lifting of oppression? Have we tried pairing fasting and prayer together because it says then your healing will appear quickly. Look at this, then righteousness will go before you and glory behind. I wanna be surrounded like that. I want that then in my life, righteousness and glory before and behind. Then God answers. How many times have we been like, God, I need to know, I need an answer from you. I need to know what you have here. That's the then of fasting. This is what God is saying happens as we turn to him with fasting. It's what Daniel saw poured in in his emptiness, didn't he? Again, like visions, understanding uh, of all, uh, what does it say? Sorry, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, understanding in all visions and dreams, which would save his life down the road. By the way, he emptied himself and God gave The then of fasting in his life, it says that the hand of God was on them. None was like Daniel, 10 times better. That's God's math, guys, isn't it? That we empty ourselves, that we follow in obedience, and God comes in 10 times better. We give up something that can set ourselves apart, and God goes, okay, now I will add here. In fact, I will multiply right here. This is the way of God. This is the way of the kingdom. When you fast, I'll add like you never could into your life. It's amazing, it's amazing. So why don't I fast? Why don't we fast, guys, why? Maybe we think that this um, outranking type excellence in life is just for the Daniels, right? Just for back then in that day. Maybe we think uh, that, uh, that God won't really appear or break into my life. Not for me, not in my life. Maybe we don't think that the payoff is gonna be worth the pain of that breakfast or that lunch or that dinner. I don't know, I don't think that, that when it comes down to it, I really believe the then of fasting will be poured into my life. I think it's a belief issue for me. 
that I don't really believe that these things are gonna happen. And I think in so many ways, it was just like did Noah not really believing that an ark was gonna save him one day, right? And so I'm making this case, guys, that we do the things that God said to do because he, God, he knows what's coming down the road. He knows the day of testing that's ahead for each of us, each of us. And so I'm asking us, I'm asking us to believe what Jesus said, and here's what Jesus teaches in Matthew 6. Jesus, this whole thing is he's teaching his disciples and he lays it out for them and he says, listen, here's what's gonna happen. He says this, when you give to the needy, okay, he's giving us this, these instructions for the future. He's like, listen, when you give, here's how you give. Do it in private. And then there's a follow-up and you're, the father will reward you, right? Okay, so when you give, yeah, yeah, we get that, we get that. And then he goes on and he says this in verse five, and when you pray, and when you pray, you're gonna give, you're gonna pray, and when you pray, pray in private, and again, the Lord will see you, and he will what? Reward you, exactly. And then he goes on to say this in 16, and when you fast, right, when you give to the needy, when you pray, when you fast, and Derek Print, Prince put this all together for me, because I never saw it before, that he's, Jesus, when he's teaching this way, there's a parallel between these three things, giving to the needy, praying and fasting, and he's putting them all on the same level. And the assumption was that his followers would do all three of these things on a regular basis, that these would be a foundational of our walk with him, right? And he's saying that when you do all of three of these things, he's putting them together, but he's also saying all three of them are just as powerful. And I think that we put in a hierarchy, right? That we believe that, um, that prayer, yes, prayer is powerful, right? Giving to the needy, it will do that uh, occasionally, right? And fasting, Lent, Friday night, right? Like once, because we don't think that they're all three as powerful, that they're gonna all three be as effective, that all three will be rewarded from the Father who sees them, that they are before him, but Jesus is putting them all together, And he's saying, you're gonna do these things. These are gonna be the foundations of your life and all three of them are just as powerful. So that means that we need to believe that fasting is just as powerful as prayer, right? That we go to it just as quickly and just as often as we pray. That's what I'm asking for us, that God will bring the then of fasting, his power and provision. Okay, quick little, you guys, I'm like, roll, I'm like so aware of the time. Are we okay? (sighs) Okay, we're okay. All right, so here are quick nitty gritties of fasting. Just to make it super, super clear, in case we don't know, fasting, <laughs> abstaining from food and drink, taking a break for a set time and purpose. And really what it's about is embracing that an emptiness of space for God again to bring what he wants to bring. And, um, and for some of us, um, if we're thinking about uh, uh, what we want to fast, how we figure out what are we gonna fast, well, here's what I would say, what comforts you? What do you run to? What do we use to reward ourselves? What might be a black hole of distraction in our life? And I I would encourage us that um, as we fast, as we think about what we could take out, um, I I would think about, guys, this is actually way more than physical, because again, that's a diet, that this is actually unto something. It's a spiritual activity. That we don't clutter up if we're fasting, um, if we are are taking a, a, you know, say like we fast breakfast, that we actually, again, pair that up with a spiritual expectation that something is gonna move in the spirit. And so we don't clutter up that time and that space. And what if medically, if you know, medically possible, I would would encourage us to try to fast a meal. And one of my favorite ways to do it is breakfast. Like maybe, you know, you don't eat after dinner and you fast breakfast until like one o'clock. You can get like, you know, a good chunk of fast in there. Or maybe for some of us, we could do um, breakfast and um, lunch. And again, like spending extra time, that time that you would maybe spend in like meal prep and clean up just before the Lord in worship before the Lord with, God, come, I need what you can bring. I need your ability. I need your wisdom in this place. Pairing it with like a spiritual expectation. And that's what I'm asking us to do is to kind of start going, you know what, I'm actually putting more stock in the spirit than in the physical, than in what could happen in the natural and what I could do in this situation. And here's why, guys, here's why this is so, so, so important. Where's my scripture? Here's the deal, guys, God is pouring out. 
God is pouring out. That ever since the beginning of time, what God has done from the very first time we meet him is he comes and he moves in a void, doesn't he? He starts filling the void and the emptiness and the space with his creative ability, with his wisdom, with his strength, with things that would, would be unimaginable and we could never dream up. He fills the skies and he fills the seas and he, he fills our body with his breath. Guys, he is a giver first and foremost, and he has never stopped giving. That he is a God who pours out and he fills in uh, with real goodness and real strength and real understanding. And Jesus taught us, he taught us how to catch what God is pouring out. And he did this in Mark 2. And, and um, while I tell a little bit about this scripture, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull out an illustration here. But in Mark 2, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Pharisees are like, Jesus, Kev, is there a, like a, well, maybe this stool. Can you grab the other stool? Over there. So Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and they're all saying, Jesus, why aren't people fasting? Like, why aren't your disciples fasting? And Jesus starts answering, and he starts answering by teaching with this lesson. And he says this. He starts talking to them about wine. And he says, listen, here's the deal. He says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. And you might go like, Jesus, this is so strange. Why are you talking about wine and wineskins in this moment? Why are, what, what's the deal with wine and wineskins? Well, here's the deal. I believe that he is explaining something foundational to us, and he tells us this. I'm sorry, I need like six hands. He's like, here's your life. Here's your life, right? And, and you've got this wineskin, and it's full. And, and here I am, I'm a God who longs to pour out. I'm a God who pours out. I'm a God who pours in. I've always wanted to give and I approach your life and I'm like, okay, all right, hey, hey, okay, here's some wisdom and some creativity and oh, there, that's all you can hold, right? That's it, that's it. And Jesus is saying, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get rid of this wine skin. Sorry, we're tr I'm trying. What? Okay, I want you Get, get rid of that wineskin, empty yourself, empty yourself, and here I am pouring out, and I have all of this. I have, wait, I have to open it. <laughs> What's wrong? I have creativity, I have wisdom, I have abundance, I have my, my voice, I have my kindness. I just wanna pour it in, I wanna pour it in, so get empty and fasting, and I can fill you up like you couldn't imagine. I could fill you up with goodness and kindness and wisdom, right? Like we want to hold what God is pouring out. This is my main point here. We want the emptiness that we can, we can be containers, that our containers can be ready for where the God of creation, the God who was from the beginning, the God who is coming back, the God who has the beginning and the end, the God who loves to, to be gracious to us, the God who loves to manifest himself, share his majesty and his glory with us. We want to hold what he is pouring out, don't we, church? So can we get our containers ready? Can we be people who will say, you know what, I'm gonna set myself apart with some fasting because God, you said this is the way that the container gets ready. This is the way that we now then display the excellence of our God in the day of testing, in the day that we stand before kings and bosses and friends and neighbors, in the day that they evaluate and out comes what only God could put in. Can we do that? Can we do that? It's gonna be costly, I think it'll be worth it. All right, let's stand up and I'm gonna pray this over us. So God, here we are. Here we are, your beloved, your people. And we say in this day, we're eager for your ways. We're jealous for your plans. You alone know what's ahead. You alone know the day of testing. You, know, you alone know the story you're writing and the glory to be on display in this earth and how you're gonna do that. And we wanna be a people who are prepared, who are set apart, who know how to turn from our limits to hold what you're pouring out.
And so God, I pray for us as a church that we'll be a people that will say, you know, God, your ways in obedience, even the things that seem small and the things that seem like they're ineffective or they might not really matter. We see what you've revealed in your word and we honor it today. We honor it today. So God, I pray that you would come, Holy Spirit, teach us how, teach us how to pray and fast. Teach us how to work this into our lives in a way that, um, again, gets, just gets our containers, the containers of our lives ready for what you're giving and what you're pouring out and what you long to pour into your creation. Because too, God, we, just, we know that we long to carry the very, the very well, the, it is well, very good of God on this earth to display your nature, your acts, your wonders in our day. And so God, I pray for these ones. I pray that, um, that not that fasting would be easy, but the fasting would be effective in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, amen. Jonathan has a quick uh, prophetic yeah. thing. Just a uh, quick word. I, it was such a good message. Actually, it was funny. I was talking to my daughters about something very similar last night on the way home. And I just, while Molly was praying, I just had a picture too of like, well, you know, why? What's on the other mm -hmm. side of that fasting? And I just felt like the Lord was saying, you know, some of us are really settling for popcorn when he has a feast. Like, like that we're like really settling for like something just so much less than what he has prepared for us. And for me, I've actually gone through my own journey of like, you know, food was very much like a comfort thing for me. And I feel like in recent months, I've been, you know, able to let a lot of that go. But when it comes to the fasting aspect, I feel like he's really saying like his goodness, he just is calling us and inviting us to step into his goodness. So if we want to step into the flames, you know, the ignition here, like it's that active step of saying, okay, God, like I'll let you, I, I trust you. And he's just got such a meal prepared. Even after the resurrection, he came back, found the disciples, and made them a meal with fish and spices. And that's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So the, the meal matters, but his meal is just so much better for us than what we're settling for now. So I just thought it was such a good word. Thank you. Thanks, too. Okay. Well, we are uh, done. Thanks for hanging in there with us. It was a different Sunday, um, but bless you guys. We love you. If anybody needs prayer, um, I know there'll be some folks up here to pray. Also, um, if, uh, if Jonathan ends up praying for you, pray for him <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Lexi, and otherwise have a wonderful Sunday, guys. Bless you. We did it. <laughs>